Let's talk about the tax plan. I mean, a lot of pretty scathing reviews. Moody saying that it's a long-term negative for the US economy. Is it necessary at this point and is it going to be impactful when it comes to having that pass, pass through to, to growth, to inflation? I think you've got to look at it uh, almost from two different perspectives. I mean, if tax reform and I think cutting the corporate tax, that makes sense. Trying to simplify the system, reduce some of the deductions, complexity, that makes sense. A tax cut at this point in the cycle makes no sense at all. You're already past full employment, so trying to stimulate growth makes no sense. But of course, in order to buy the votes for the reform side of it, you have to offer some sweeteners, and otherwise you wouldn't be able to get it passed. So I think the two things go together, but from a, a demand management point of view, it looks uh, completely unnecessary. And I suppose, you know, the other big theme of the year for a lot of central banks is searching for this, you know, an answer to the inflation conundrum, right? Does that change? Is there a risk going into 2018 that all of a sudden we'll get more inflation pressures than perhaps we're expecting at the moment? I think that's one of the key risks we're looking at uh, for the markets in 2018, that 2017 the inflation rate was um, almost inexplicably low. And you quite often just get mean reversion in these factors. Something goes from being uh, inexplicably low to inexplicably high and, and things uh, bounce back again. So I think there is a risk that, uh, especially from March, when the year-on-year -year rate is going to step higher, that people really focus on inflation and you get a bounce back. And then you really question whether the central banks, not just the Fed, but maybe outside America as well, can really go as slowly as they've been indicating they will. And you know, if you start to get a bit more of a hawkish rhetoric coming out of the central banks, that could be, that could be quite tough, I think, for, the, for financial markets after such a fantastic year in 2017. Well, let me just bring up what you've written, actually, in your research, and this is what it is. Uh, generally, we are moderately cautious looking into 2018. Everything looks expensive. There's not much room for positive growth surprises. You hit capacity limits. Plenty of bad inflation, uh, room for a bad inflation surprise. God, you're depressing. <laughs> well, you know, that's economics. We're not supposed to be the, the, the guys driving the party. Um, but, but realistically, you should remember, 2017, just about everything went well. You had positive growth surprise, not just in America, but right across the world. A negative inflation surprise, but not too negative that you're worried about deflation. Very patient central banks. Uh, tax reform capping the end of it. And of course, you've got the guy in the White House who everybody was afraid at the start of the year might do something crazy. And in fact, nothing really much has, has happened too much. Hard to see that 2018 can be quite as uh, benign as the past 12 months. Well, you could argue that the U.S helped to drive global growth. Will the rest of the world be driving global growth uh, in uh, the couple of years to come? Uh, I'm not really convinced the US did drive global growth. I think in Europe you can see a lot of it was the, the internal uh, dynamics, the, some of the paybacks of structural reform, some of the better traction of monetary policy. And outside of that, a lot of these countries, they have been pursuing their own internal uh, reform programs after a few tough years. Uh, and you can see the revival in countries like Brazil or Russia and the turnaround of these countries has got nothing to do uh, with what's been going on in America. So people have talked about a synchronized recovery. I don't really think it's synchronized. I think it's simply that lots of countries are finding the internal positive dynamic at the same time. And I think that's good news because it should mean that the recovery cycle is resilient. Even if there is a slowdown in one or two centers or one or two uh, industries, I think it gives you a better resilience of the overall global cycle uh, in 2018. So I want to throw up this quick chart, which has been one of the kind of resounding uh, conundrums of this year, other than where's the inflation, right? 72.07, uh, US 2 and 10 years. I mean, you pull this back and an inverted US yield curve, which a lot of analysts are saying we're going to get next year, it often portends something terrible happening to the economy, right? But is it that this time it's different to you because we have had this decade of extraordinary monetary policy? Why? What's your explanation of this? Because we heard from the Dallas Fed President Robert Kaplan his concern that this is more meaningful. Yeah, we've been looking at this a lot, uh, obviously. I, we're not that worried about it because normally the yield curve inverts after policy becomes tight which is to say after short-term rates go above uh, neutral. A neutral, depending on you believe, is 25 maybe 3%. I think you would explain the, 
the unusually flat yield curve, you know, not, not inverted, but flat yield curve, really as a function of the, the global QE that's still taking place, tremendous demand from overseas for U.S. assets, for U.S. safe haven assets, that seems to be holding down the long end of the curve more than you would expect. So I think it's a version of the sort of conundrum that we had, uh, whatever, 10, 15 years ago, uh, when, uh, when, when Ben Bernanke was, was running the Fed, that he talked about obviously different cause of that demand for U.S. debt, but a very similar impact. It's interesting, isn't it? The market seemed pretty sanguine with this idea that the unwind from the Fed, potentially the ECB, going into next, next year is going to be a smooth transition and nothing is really going to go wrong. Do you think a policy misstep from a central bank is, is a big risk next year? Or would you be looking to something like you know, a, a steeper slowdown than expected in China as being the bigger problem? I think it's not so much the policy misstep you'd worry about. It's how the markets respond to the policy. Uh, I mean, the, the new supply hitting the U.S. bond market is going to be you know, roughly doubling uh, with the, the increase in the deficit that's already being seen and then the, uh, the change in Fed policy. And then you get the ECB uh, basically tapering down to nothing by the end of the year. Maybe even the Bank of Japan becoming more honest about the fact that it's reduced its bond purchases. And then that, that wall of money, that... Uh, uh, we see a peaking of the, uh, the balance sheets of the big three central banks by about the third quarter next year, and then it starts to shrink. So that is a different environment for the market. I'm not sure you'd call it a, a misstep, but in terms of exactly how that affects risk premia, I think that's going to be uh, something of a challenge in the second half of next year. What about China? How does China do in 2018? Uh, well, I mean, we're always worried about China because of the massive credit bubble. And, of course, the credit bubble has gone up more slowly in the past 12 months, but it's still going up. And you, you get the sense that, OK, they're going to try a little bit harder to, to squeeze the credit, and that's more likely to have more of an economic impact than it's had over the past 12 months. I mean, certainly not much damage over the past 12 months. But we still think that, given the choice, that they're going to be tolerant of continued increase in credit in order to keep growth on track. So something above 6% still looks reasonable for next year. Of course, they can always get it wrong. There seems to be this bizarre assumption in the market that the Chinese policymakers are sort of see, all-seeing, all-knowing, all-powerful, whereas uh, you know, in reality, uh, you, you tend to be badly disappointed when you, you run your investments on, on that basis. So there is certainly plenty of room for a policy misstep in China just because the si system is so... Uh, precarious. Um, but it's hard to say, if you like, why it would happen uh, in next year rather than last year or, or the year before that. You can't see an obvious trigger to cause a big problem. There has been a move to have more policy transparency. That's, of, of course, a good thing. As we get more of that, do you think that certain things will go by the wayside, such as, and I think you alluded to it, there's targeting of GDP growth that many people are saying should be really abandoned? I'm very doubtful you get much more policy transparency. I don't think there's any real incentives for them to have any sort of open communication with the market. Uh, it's nothing like a, a democratic country where you can see the efficiency gains from having a, a lot of transparency. And I think it's one of those things also, they can change their minds. Transparency might work as long as uh, they're getting the outcomes they want. But if the markets take the wrong view, uh, then you can easily see the shutters coming down. And we've, of course, had that in the equity market. We've had that in the, uh, in the capital controls on, on foreign outflows over the past few years. So I'm, I'm very dubious about any sort of uh, promise of openness because it can easily be, uh, be rescinded. The other day, uh, Donald Trump made that speech of, on national security highlighting effectively Russia and China as frenemies. They haven't quite uh, turned out... Well, the, the, those trade frictions haven't turned out this year as many people have anticipated. Uh, will they really be a big risk in 2018? Yeah, to us, that's been one of the pleasant surprises the past 12 months that uh, nothing's happened on the trade front. Because remember, the American deficit is at a 10-year high and it's going up even before you have tax cuts, which is going to make it go up even, even faster. Half that deficit is with China. So it's an easy target. Of course, it's not really just China's deficit. It's the whole region's trade with America going through China. But there's obviously the potential for this to be the next issue now that tax reform's been done. And if you're cynical, which, of course, uh, we're not, you might say that if you're a president trying to distract people from your domestic uh, failings and domestic un unpopularity, 
you might want to pick a fight with somebody outside the country just to try to distract people or, or rally support around the flag. So it's going to be a persistent risk given the, uh, given the characters involved in making U.S. policy.